I know you probably have some questions after last time. It's difficult to explain any of these things because it's all so referential and interconnected. You end up sort of tumbling down these rabbit holes of different concepts, different people, different things, and it's difficult to explain one of them without needing to explain all of them, but we only have so much time together. So we'll talk more today about Jung and his collective unconscious. And it's a little unfair to actually attribute the collective unconscious to Jung, as you'll see. He just had the position of being one of those popularizers that you come across every now and then, where the ideas he talks about, they're not new at all, but it's sort of the first time you hear them coming from a respectable person. And so it tends to get latched on to popularize. You sort of see it as more scientific, right? Because you have someone like Jung associated with what used to be a respected psychologist. And between the two of them, they did a lot of looking into psychology, the inner workings of the mind and such. But when we talk about the collective unconscious, we're not really talking about a new concept that was invented. It's just the notion that we're all a little more connected than we think. And so you can see how this sort of naturally evolves from Freud's psychology, is that if we have this unconscious mind that's doing who knows what without us, what else is it doing? And if we see common patterns in this unconscious mind, is that related to common experiences, or is that related to some sort of shared psyche between all people. And it leads us to an interesting question is, where do standard scientific concepts like the brain end? And where do stranger concepts like the collective unconscious begin? And there's concepts even stranger that appear as you go further in. But starting off, we start with the basic science. Just the notion that there's certain qualia, certain phenomenon associated with walking around and thinking all the time. That you have certain memories, certain archetypes that appear. And that's all pretty normal really, right? We're all raised by some sort of parental figure. We have our sort of childlike development based around that. And there's nothing really controversial about that at all. And where Jung started being a little more controversial is when he suggested that not only are these shared experiences producing somewhat common results, but our minds are actually connected on some level. And so when we explore that collective unconscious through some form of meditation or research, that we're actually exploring other people's minds. And this isn't a new idea. You have things like the Rosicrucians, who were popularizing ideas something along the lines of egregores. And egregores are a very interesting concept. They're the notion that what people are believing can be manifested at scale. So in the sense that if everyone starts worshipping some strange demon, even if that strange demon isn't you know, a real spiritual demon, you can still get this effect of influence in the world, influence on that collective unconscious through the manifestation of all these different thoughts. And this is a concept much older than Jung, but you know, you're not going to see popular psychologists talking about hidden occult orders from a long time ago. And that's perfectly natural once you attach your face and your name and your professional income to certain things, you become very limited in how you can talk about them. But the outgrowth of the egregore from the collective unconscious is something very relevant. Because if the collective unconscious exists, it means that it can be manipulated in some way. And the manipulation of it can either be for good or bad ends. And so a fairly sizable degree of occult teaching revolves around teaching people how to manipulate this shared experience. It's an interesting exercise to look around today and see what sort of egregores could be out there, what kind of 
shared hallucinations have given birth to these strange creatures that can begin to act on our world. And if you want to entertain these concepts, it's relatively easy to look around and see exactly what we're talking about. You can look at politics and culture and see where these thought forms that have been created can begin to kind of manifest, often with significant results. And this is about where Jung stopped. You can read more about his explorations of this in his Red Book. But if you're interested in the deeper, more occult things, then it's important to understand that the collective unconscious is really just the tip of the iceberg here. You know, as we tumble down into this other world where human psychology begins to have these strange ripple effects and contact what some consider Jung to have thought to be some sort of world spirit, is while we're in this other world, what else is there? Are we going to find things that are inhuman? I know last time we talked about the machine elves, and they're certainly down there. And you can either see them as a common psychological phenomena, somehow related to our biology. You could see them as these egregores that people have thought existed and wanted to talk to so much that now they're talking back. Or you could even see them as spirits that somehow predate people, either the thought forms of an earlier species or perhaps something of their own. And you have to be somewhat empirical while you're evaluating these things. Are the things you're talking to able to know things you don't know? Are they able to do things you can't do? That's sort of a good basic barometer of where these things are, whether they're just purely psychological phenomena, part of this collective phenomena, or even something stranger than that. But you have to be careful making these evaluations because you know, if these spirits are real and they are conscious, you don't know what they want you to think. A lowly egregore might want you to believe he's some kind of powerful demon that can do all these things for you if you only believe. And that same powerful demon might actually prefer you think he's a lowly egregore that you don't really need to worry about. Perhaps he'd even rather you think he's just a odd psychological phenomenon you don't really need to think more about. But he's might still be real, might still be doing things to you, might even still be changing the world. But regardless of what level of phenomenon you're willing to accept, you can see historically how much the world's changed because of these sort of things. You have people like Jack Parsons at the Rocket Propulsion Lab. You have Crowley doing work for British intelligence. You have people like John Dee trying to figure out the navigation systems of the British naval empire. But again, all these people are probably not quite as influential as they'd like you to believe, which is then contrasted with people who are far more influential than they'd like you to believe. Perhaps people who've written books about the alchemy of finance. Perhaps people who like to speak to vibrating crystals in order to create new worlds, and then make use of these crystal-made worlds to trap people in, trap their souls, trap their minds, to begin extracting both mental and physical resources, you know, money, time, attention, all this sort of thing to improve their own standing. But I think we've again found ourselves in a position where anything we're talking about right now could be an entire conversation in and of itself, but there's only so much time. Don't worry, I'll talk to you again soon.